This is part three of lecture one. In this part, we're going to talk about perspectives in social psychology. Um, so social psychology is a discipline within psychology. But also within social psychology, there are different schools, you could say, different views on uh, the ways in which we try to explain human uh, behavior. And there's various different perspectives. I'm going to zoom into three of them uh, in this part of the lecture. Uh, evolutionary perspective, the social cultural perspective and the social learning perspective. So let's start off with a perspective that you're probably already familiar with. It's the evolutionary perspective. So the basic idea of the evolution uh, theory and the evolutionary perspective on human behavior is that the, be the way that we behave today, the social behavior will demonstrate the way we treat other people, the way we look at each other uh, in social situations. That's all explained in terms of genetic factors that are adapted over centuries to improve the chance of either survival, so it helped us to stay alive, or reproduction, so it helped us to reproduce, to have children, and uh, give our genes to the next generation. So, of course, uh, you're all familiar with uh, this guy over here. His name is Charles Darwin. Uh, he is uh, definitely the founding father of evolution theory. And the basic idea of, uh, of evolution theory is the concept of natural selection. And uh, with natural selection, um, we mean that this is the process in which important features that are beneficial for either survival or reproduction are passed on to future generations, so are passed on to offspring. This idea of natural selection is really quite old already, um, just like uh, Charles Darwin, he lived uh, centuries ago, but it's still uh, very helpful in explaining uh, behavior and also explaining the way that we look today. So, so what I look like today is also the, the, the consequence of, of an adaptation over centuries. And this idea of natural selection, of course, not only applies to humans, it applies to all animals. And the beauty of evolution theory is that it's something that you can study yourself as well. So let me now give you an example of an experiment that you could personally do, in which you can test the basic idea of natural selection. The only thing you need is, um, well, a, quite a big backyard and time. I would say like two years of your time. Then you can do the following experiment. Um, so this is the guppy experiment. And in this guppy experiment, um, you just buy a lot of guppies, little fish, and you spread them over 10 different ponds in your backyard. So you have to dig 10 ponds, so you need quite a big backyard. And you spread these guppies um, uh, over these different ponds. But you vary the ponds. They are not all identical. There's differences. There's two major differences. First of all, the soil varies. So you can have five ponds uh, with five fine sands as soil. So on the, on the uh, bottom of the pond, there's fine sand. And five of the other ponds have pebbles. So it's a different soil. Doesn't really affect the guppies. They are happy in both ponds. But it's just a difference in surroundings. And then there's another difference. And that is that in some ponds, you introduce a predator, which is a carp. The carps are really, really fond of guppies. So they eat the guppies. Then you just wait and see what happens. Specifically, you wait one and a half years, which is many, 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 many gen generations for guppies, because the guppies don't live very long. So one and a half years later, you come back to your backyard and you see what happens. And specifically, you're going to watch the guppies and you're going to see, did they change? Did they adapt based on their surroundings? And I can promise you, if you don't have the time to actually conduct this experiment, I can tell you what happens. And if you don't believe me, you can do it yourself. So. There's two different things that happen. First of all, there's a difference between the ponds with or without the carp. Let's first look at the ponds with the carp, so with the predator. What happened there? The appearance of the guppies changed. Okay, so what did the guppies start to look like in these different ponds? So what you will find is that in the pond with the fine sand as a soil, the guppies developed small brown dots. And in the uh, ponds with the pebbles, they developed bigger brown dots. So camouflage. So they created an appearance in which it would be harder for the carps to catch them and eat them. So this is a very great example of how evolution works. So the guppies that happened to have a certain appearance, which worked as camouflage, 
had a higher chance of actually staying alive in these ponds with the carp. So therefore, um, this um, appearance of having, for example, small brown dots in the fine sand soil, um, that helped them to survive. And this is what this feature is passed on to future generations. So then you might be wondering, but what about the ponds without the carp? So if there's actually no chance of being eaten, you have quite a good likelihood of staying alive, will your appearance then also change? So do you think that the guppies still um, basically adapted themselves to the surroundings and developed brown dots uh, in different forms? No, they didn't. They didn't really adjust their, their appearance based on the soil, but they did still change their appearance. What did they do? Actually, the male guppies developed very bright colors. They really actually did the complete opposite of camouflage. They made themselves stand out. Why did they do so? Well, to become irresistible for the female guppies. So only the male guppies changed their appearance, making very bright colors to be attractive for the females. So if you're not focused so much on staying alive, then you're focusing on the other attributes of the uh, evolution theory, which is reproduction. You want to have the highest chance of getting your, uh, your genes to the next generation. So the male guppies did so by developing very bright colors. So I think this is a very cool experiment in which you can really see how evolution is changing, in this case, guppy uh, appearance. But it also applies to humans. So how can evolution and the idea of natural selection and evolution theory help us to explain human behavior? Well, first of all, we know that people actually have a lot in common with other animals. And this is also something that evolution uh, theory would uh, expect. So think, for example, about facial expressions, like you can see on this slide here. But also displays of power and status. That's basically the same for humans and other animals, especially primates. Um, so we humans are also just animals, and we are just part of the whole food chain. Sometimes we tend to forget it, but we are. And uh, therefore, we have a lot in common with other animals. So and that's also uh, what evolution would expect. Secondly, um, there are some habits that are universal among humans. So irrespective of where you live, in which culture you grow up, uh, in which uh, context you, uh, you live, um, you will show some behavior uh, nevertheless. Uh, think, for example, about forming relationships. All humans across the globe, irrespective of where they live and which culture, form relationships. The way they relationship, these relationships develop and what they look like, the, that's different. But they all do form relationships, and that's also because forming relationships is essential for us humans to stay alive and reproduce. So evolution theory is a very strong perspective. It is used a lot still up to this very day to explain human behavior. But it cannot explain everything, because humans also differ between cultures, for example, and that's where the social-cultural perspective comes in. So there's differences between people depending on where they live. Um, and uh, in the social-cultural perspective, behavior is explained uh, in terms of the influence of the larger group that you live in. What are the, the, the ways people connect to each other in that specific culture? What is normal behavior? in the specific group that you live in. And culture, the social cultural perspective, can help us to explain human behavior, for example, by um, noticing that some habits, traditions, and behavior are different depending on cultural context. For example, what we eat. Uh, I would not really prefer eating either one of those, these um, uh, animals, but uh, they are delicacies in some cultures. So what we eat is, you think that's a matter of taste, but it's also definitely a matter of where you uh, grew up. Uh, and also, um, of course, human behavior. So what is the correct way of greeting a person? And here you see a very nice illustration of both people from separate cultures trying to um, be empathic and use the correct way of greeting a person uh, on the culture uh, that's, uh, that the other person is from. So this is two people trying really hard. Uh, but it's still a, a really a source of miscommunication. So there's many misunderstandings across cultures, also uh, between groups based on a difference in culture. So what is appropriate behavior, what is normal behavior, really varies from group to group. And it's really important to be aware of this when you try to make sense of how humans behave. So what is inappropriate in a certain context is very appropriate in other contexts. 
Um, and there's certain groups of uh, social psychologists that are really interested in this, and uh, they uh, typically conduct cross-cultural research. And this uh, is research that is conducted with members of different uh, cultures, and um, oftentimes the researchers are interested in whether one variable um, is different between uh, members of certain uh, groups. Um, so in this perspective... Um, what is really taking into account is that we are influenced by our environment. And that basic idea is the same for the third perspective. That's the perspective of, perspective of social learning. So in the social learning perspective, social behavior is explained in terms of learning experiences in the past that predict our future behavior. So how we've developed, especially in our youth, that's a really a main focus of the social learning perspective, is shaping our behavior today. And you might be wondering, how does this social learning perspective help us to explain human behavior? Um, well, if, for example, during your childhood, you grew up with the concept of religion, and uh, every week you visited chur the church with your parents, then there's actually quite a high likelihood that you'll still be going to church even if you leave your house. And maybe even if you start a family yourself, there's a higher likelihood of you to, uh, to embrace the concept of in religion later in life as well. Of course, you can also decide to not do so and make a very conscious choice to leave that aspect behind. But there's definitely a higher likelihood of being religious and going to church if this, this is, has been part of your upbringing. And the same goes for social behaviors. Uh, for example, if it was very normal for you when you grew up to help maybe elderly, maybe your grandmother lived in your house and you helped her. Um, and this is something, a concept of helping others, especially vulnerable people. If this is a concept that you grew up with, then this is likely something that is st still affecting you when uh, you grow up and you get older. So uh, this is actually very beautiful, of course. So as, as parents, you have a lot of responsibility to you know, protect, uh, protect your children and, and love them and, and, and make sure you uh, create an environment that is, that is safe and warm and, and uh, full of opportunities. But it's also, and this is something a lot of parents don't realize uh, um, enough, I think, uh, is that also by showing behavior, doing s things yourself, you're really affecting uh, your children. And this also, of course, goes for negative behaviors, such as smoking. We know that children who grew up with uh, parents who smoked or two parents who smoked have a higher likelihood of smoking themselves. Um, so the core idea of, uh, of the social learning perspective is that people are prone to show behaviors that they have earlier witnessed in role models. So, and that's mostly your parents, but it can also be your teacher, for example, or your grandparents, or maybe your neighbor, someone that you spend a lot of time with. Um, so we have these three different perspectives in social psychology. We actually have more, but these are the, the perspectives that I decided to focus on for now. Um, and what I found really in, uh, important to, to add uh, when, when I'm closing off this part of the lecture is that there's always an interaction between these perspectives. So let's, for example, consider language. Um, having language and communicating with each other, that's uh, really uh, part of being a human. So evolution ther theory can really help us understand that learning language is universal. It's something that all humans do. But the specific language that we speak depends on where we grew up. And there, the cultural perspective can help us understand why we speak a certain language. So this is a very nice ex example of both the, both the evolutionary perspective and the social cultural perspective, ha perspective helping us to understand human behavior. Um, so it's also important to realize that it's not the case that one perspective is better or superior to others. Even though in science you always have sort of this, this idea of a battle, especially when you're writing an article and getting your idea published, that you want to uh, uh, show uh, to uh, the people reading your article, reading your work, that uh, you know uh, how humans actually behave and what is true human behavior. But it's very important to realize that all these perspectives are valuable and they can uh, together help us understand uh, why humans do what they do.